All right, I'm back. Thank you for letting me take a little break. Um, we're at chapter 25 of The House of the Vampire. And we got about six chapters left, and we're going to finish this. So let's pick up. Only three hours had passed since Ethel had startled Ernest from his somber reveries. But within this brief space, their love had matured as if each hour had been a year. The pallor had vanished from his cheeks and the restiveness from his eyes. The intoxication of her presence had rekindled the light of his countenance and given him strength to combat the mighty forces embodied in Reginald Clark. The child in him had made room for the man. He would not hear of surrendering without a struggle, and Ethel felt sure she might leave his fate in her own hand. Love had lent him a coat of mail. He was worn, and would not succumb. Still, she made one more attempt to persuade him to leave the house at once with her. <clears throat> I must go now, she said. Will you not come with me after all? I am so afraid to think of you still here. No, dear, he replied. I shall not desert my post. I must solve the riddle of this man's life, and if, indeed, he is the theme, thing he seems to be, I shall attempt to wrest from him what he has stolen from me. I speak of my unwritten novel. Do not attempt to oppose him openly. You cannot resist him. Be assured that I shall be on my guard. I have in the last few hours lived through so much that makes life worth living that I would, would not wantonly expose myself to any danger. Still, I cannot go without certainty. Can I? If there is some truth in our fears, leave the best of me behind. What are you planning to do? My play? I am sure now that it is mine. I cannot take from him. That is ir irretrievably lost. He has read it to his circle and prepared for its publication. And no matter how firmly convinced you or I may be of his strange power, no one would believe our testimony. They would pronounce us mad. Perhaps we are mad. No, we are not mad. But it is mad for you to stay here, she asserted. I shall not stay here one minute longer than it is absolutely essential. Within a week, I shall have conclusive proof of his guilt or innocence. How will you go about it? His writing table. His writing table. Ah. Yes, perhaps I can discover some note, some indication, some proof. It is a dangerous game. I have everything to gain. I wish I could stay with you, she said. Have you no friend? No one whom you can trust in this delicate matter? Why, yes, Jack. A shadow passed over her face. Do you know, she said, I have a feeling that you care more for him than for me. Nonsense, he said, he is my friend. You, you, immeasurably more. Are you still as intimate with him as when I first met you? Not quite. Of late, a troubling something, like a thin veil, seems to have passed between us. But he will come when I call him. He will not fail me in my hour of need. When can he be here? In two or three days. Meanwhile, be very careful. Above all, lock your door at night. I will not only lock, but barricade it. I shall try with all my power to elucidate this mystery without, however, exposing myself to needless risks. I will go. Then. Kiss me goodbye. May I not take you to the car? You had better not. At the door, she turned back once more. Write me every day, or call me up on the telephone. He straightened himself as if to convince her of his strength. Yet when at last the door had closed behind her, his courage forsook him for a moment. And, if he had not yet been ashamed to appear a weakling before the woman he loved, who knows if any power, who knows if any power on earth could have kept him in that house, where from every corner a secret seemed to lurk. There was a misgiving, too, in the woman's heart as she left the boy behind a prey to the occult power that, seeking expression in multiple activities, has made and unmade emperors, prophets, and poets. As she stepped into a street, as she stepped into a streetcar, she saw from afar, as in a vision, the face of Reginald Clark. It seemed very white and hungry. There was no human kindness in it, only a threat and a sneer. For over an hour, 
<clears throat> Ernest paced up and down in his room, wildly excited by Ethel's revelations. It required an immense amount of self-control for him to pen the following lines to Jack. I need you. Come. <clears throat> After he had entrusted the letter to the hall boy, a reaction set in, and he was able to consider the matter, if not with equanimity, at least with a degree of calmness. <clears throat> the strangest thing to him was that he could not bring himself to hate Reginald, of whose evil influence upon his life he was now firmly convinced. Here was another shattered idol, but one, like the fragment of a great god face in the desert, intensely fascinating, even in its ruin. Then, yielding to a natural impulse, Ernest looked over his photographs and at once laid hold the austere image of his master and friend. No, it was preposterous. There was no evil in this man. There was no trace of malice in this face. The face of a prophet or an inspired madman, a poet. And yet, as he scrutinized the picture closely, a curious transformation seemed to take place in the features. A sly little line appeared insinuating about Reginald's well-formed mouth, and the serene calm of his Jupiter head seemed to turn into the sneak smile of a thief. Nevertheless, Ernest was not afraid. His anxieties had at last assumed definite shape. It was possible now to be on his guard. It is only invisible, incomprehensible fear crouching upon us from the night that drives sensitive natures to the verge of madness and transforms stern warriors into cowards. Ernest realized the necessity of postponing the proposed investigation of Reginald's papers until the morning, as it was now near eleven, and he expected to hear, at any moment, the sound of feet at the door. Before retiring, he took a number of precautions. Carefully, he locked the door to his bedroom and placed a chair in front of it. To make doubly sure, he fastened the handle to an exquisite Chinese vase, a gift of Reginald's, that, at the least attempt of force, to force an entrance from without, would come down with a crash. Then, although sleep seemed out of the question, he went to bed. He had hardly touched the pillow when a leaden weight seemed to fall upon his eyes. The day's commotion had been too much for his delicate frame. By force of habit, he pulled the cover over his ear and fell asleep. At night he slept heavily, and the morning was far advanced when a knock at his door that at first seemed to come across an immeasurable distance brought him back to himself. It was Reginald's manservant announcing that breakfast was waiting. Ernest got up and rubbed his eyes. The barricade at the door at once brought back to his mind with startling clearness the events of the previous evening. Everything was as he had left it. Evidently, no one had attempted to enter the room while he slept. He could not help smiling at the arrangement which reminded him of his childhood, when he had sought by similar means security from burglars and bogies, boogies. And in the broad daylight, Ethel's tales of vampires seemed once more impossible and absurd. Still, he had abundant evidence of Reginald's strange influence and was determined to know the truth before nightfall. Her words that thought is more real than blood kept ringing in his ears. If such was the case, he would find evidence of Reginald's intellectual burglaries and possibly be able to regain a part of his lost self that had been snatched from him by the relentless dream hand. But under no circumstances could he face Reginald in his present state of mind. He was convinced that if in the fleeting vision of a moment the other, the other man's true nature should reveal itself to him, he would be so terribly afraid as to shriek like a maniac. So he dressed particularly slowly in the hope of avoiding an encounter with his host. But fate thwarted this hope. Reginald, too, lingered that morning, unusually long over his coffee. He was just taking his last sip when Ernest entered the room. His behavior was of an almost bourgeois kindness. Benevolence fairly beamed from his face, but to the boy's eyes it had assumed a new and sinister expression. You were late this morning, Ernest, he remarked in his mildest manner. Have you been about town or writing poetry? Both occupations are equally unhealthy. As he said this, he watched the young man with an inscrutable smile that at moments was wont to curl around upon his lips. Ernest had once likened it to the smile of Mona Lisa, but he now detected in the, the suavity of the hip hypocrite and the leer of the criminal. He could not endure it. He could not look upon that face any longer. His feet almost gave way under him. 
Cold sweat gathered on his brow, and he sank on a chair, trembling and studiously avoiding the other man's gaze. At last, Reginald rose to go. It seemed impossible to accuse this splendid imperson imp imp impersonation of vigorous manhood, of cunning and underhand methods, of plagiarisms and of theft. As he stood there, he resembled more than anything a beautiful tiger cat, a wonderful thing of strength and willpower, indomitable and insatiate. Yet, who could tell whether the strength was not, after all, parasitic? If Ethel's suspicions were justified, then, indeed, more had been taken from him than he could ever realize. For, in that case, it was his lifeblood that circled in those veins and the fire of his intellect that set those lips aflame. All right, chapter 27. Reginald Clark had hardly left the room when Ernest hastily rose from his seat. While it was likely that he would remain in an undisturbed possession of the apartment the whole, one, the whole morning, the stake at hand was too great to permit of delay. Palpitating and a little uncertain, he entered the studio where, scarcely a year ago, Reginald Clark had bidden him welcome. Nothing had changed there since then, only in Ernest's mind, the room had assumed an aspect of evil. The Antinous was there, and the Fawn, and the Christ Head, but their juxtaposition to today partook of the nature of the blasphemous. The statues of Shakespeare and Balzac seemed to frown from their pedestals at his fingers, as his fingers were running through Reginald's papers. He brushed against the semblance of Napoleon that was standing on the writing table so that it toppled over and made a noise that weirdly re-echoed in the silence of the room. At that moment, a curious family resemblance between Shakespeare, Balzac, Napoleon, and Reginald forcibly impressed itself upon his mind. It was the indisputable something that marks those who are chosen to give ultimate expression to some gigantic world purpose. In Balzac's face, it was diffused with kindliness. In that of Napoleon, sheer brutality predominated. The image of one who was said to be the richest man of the world also rose before his eyes. Perhaps it was only the play of his fevered imagination, but he could have sworn that this man's features, too, bore the mark of those unoriginal, great, absorptive minds, who, for better or for worse, are born to rob and rule. They seem to him monsters that know neither justice nor pity, only the law of their being, the law of growth. Common weapons would not avail against such forces. Being one, they were stronger than armies, nor could they be overcome in a single combat. Stealth, trickery, the outfit of the knave were legitimate weapons in such a fight. In this case, the end justifies the means, even if the latter included burglary. After a brief and fruitless search of the desk, he attempted to force open a secret drawer, the presence of which he had one day accidentally discovered. He tried a number of keys to no account, and was thinking of giving up his researches for the day until he procured a skeleton key, when at last the lock gave way. The drawer disclosed a large file of manuscript. Ernest paused for a moment to draw breath. The paper rustled under his nervous fingers, and there, at last, his eyes lit upon a bulky bundle that bore this legend. Leontina, a novel. It was true, then. All his dream, Reginald's confession, and the house that had opened its door so kindly to him was the house of a vampire. Finally, curiosity overcame his burning indignation. He attempted to read. The letters seemed to dance before his eyes. His hands trembled. At last he succeeded. The words that had first rolled over like a drunken soldier's the words that had first rolled over like drunken soldiers now marched before his vision in orderly sequence. He was delighted, then stunned. This was indeed authentic literature. There could be no doubt about it. And it was his. He was still a poet, a great poet. He drew a deep breath. Sudden joy trembled in his heart. The story set down by a foreign hand had grown chapter by chapter in his brain. There were some slight changes, slight deviations from the original plan. A defter hand than his had retouched it here and there, but for all that remained his very own, it did not belong to that thief. The blood welled to his cheeks as he uttered this word that, applied to Reginald, seemed almost sacrilegious. He had nearly reached the last chapter when he heard steps in the hallway. Hurriedly, he restored the manuscript to its place, 
closed the drawer, and left the room on tiptoe. It was Reginald, but he did not come alone. Some was, someone was speaking to him. The voice seemed familiar. Ernest could not make out what it said. He listened intently, and, was it possible? Jack. Surely he could not yet have come in response to his note. What mysterious power, what dim presen pres presentiment of his friend's plight had led him hinder, hither? Hither! <laughs> okay, hold on, I'm lost. But why did he linger so long in Reginald's room instead of hastening to greet him? Cautiously, he drew nearer. This time he caught Jack's words. It would be very convenient and pleasant. Still, some way, I feel that it is not right for me, of all men, to take his place here. That need not concern you, Reginald deliberately replied. The dear boy expressed a desire to leave me within a fortnight. I think he will go to some private sanitarium. His nerves are frightfully overstrained. This seems hardly surprising after the terrible attack he had when you read your play. That idea has since then developed into a monomania. I'm awfully sorry for him. I cared much for him, perhaps too much, but I always feared that he would come to such an end. Of late, his letters have been strangely unbalanced. You will find him very much changed. In fact, he is no longer the same. No, said Jack, he is no longer the friend I loved. Ernest clutched for the wall. His face was contorted with intense agony. Each word was like a small nail driven into his flesh. Crucified upon the cross of his own affection by the hand he loved, all white and trembling he stood there. Tears rushed to his eyes, but he could not weep. Dry-eyed he reached his room and threw himself upon his bed. Thus he lay, uncomforted and alone. Terrible, as was his loneliness. A meeting with Jack would have been more terrible. And, after all, it was true. A gulf had opened between them. Ethel alone could bring solace to his soul. There was a great void in his heart where only she could fill. He hungered for the touch of her hand. He longed for her presence strongly, as a wanton lust for pleasure and as sad men crave death. Noiselessly, he stole to the, to the door so as to not arouse the attention of the other two men, whose every whisper pierced his heart like a dagger. When he came to Ethel's home, he found that she had gone out for a breath of air. The servant ushered him into the parlor, and there he waited, waited, and waited for her. Greatly calmed by his walk, he turned the details of Clark's conversation over in his mind, and the conviction grew upon him that the friend of his boyhood was not to blame for his course of action. Reginald probably had encircled Jack's soul with his demonical influence and singled him out for another victim. That must never be. It was his turn to save now. He would warn his friend of the danger that threatened him, even if his words should be spoken into the wind. For Reginald, with an ingenuity almost satanic, had already suggested that the delusion of former days had developed into a monomania. And any attempt on his own part to warn Jack would only seem to confirm his theory. In that case, only one way was left open. He must plead with Reginald himself, confront at all risk that snatcher of souls. Tonight he would not fall asleep. He would keep his vigil. And if Reginald should approach his room, if in some way he felt the direful presence, he must speak out, threaten if need be, to save his friend from ruin. He had fully determined upon this course when a cry of joy from Ethel, who had just returned from her walk, interrupted his reverie. But her gladness changed to anxiety when she saw how pale he was. Ernest recounted to her the happenings of the day from the discovery of his novel and Reginald's desk to the conversation which he had accidentally overheard. He noticed that her features brightened as he drew near the end of his tale. Was your novel finished? she suddenly asked. I think so. Then you are out of danger. He will want nothing else of you. But you should have taken it with you. I had only sufficient presence of mind to slip it back into the drawer. Tomorrow I shall simply demand it. You will do nothing of the kind. It is in his handwriting, and you have no legal proof that it is yours. You must take it away secretly, and he will not dare to reclaim it. And Jack? She had quite forgotten Jack. 
Women are invariably selfish for those that they love. You must warn him, she replied. He would laugh at me. However, I must speak to Reginald. It is of no avail to speak to him. At least you must not do so before you have obtained the manuscript. It would unnecessarily jeopardize our plans. And after? After, perhaps. But you must not expose yourself to any danger. No, dear, he said, and kissed her. What danger is there, provided that I keep my wits about me? He steals upon men only in their sleep and in the dark. Be careful, none, nevertheless. I shall, in fact. I think he is not home at this moment. If I go now, I may be able to get a hold of the manuscript and hide it before he returns. I cannot but tremble to think of you in that house. You shall have no more reason to tremble in a day or two. Shall I see you tomorrow? I don't think so. I must go over my papers and things so as to be ready at any moment to leave the house. And then? Then. He took her in his arms and looked deeply into her eyes. Yes, she replied. At least perhaps. Then he turned to go, resolute and happy. How strangely he had matured since the summer. Her heart swelled with the consciousness that it was her love that had affected this transformation. As I cannot expect you tomorrow, I shall probably go to the opera. But I shall be at home before midnight. Will you call me up then? A word from you will put me at ease for the night, even if it comes over the telephone. I will call you up. We moderns have an advantage over the ancients in this respect. The 20th century Pyramus can speak to Thisbe even if innumerable walls sever his body from hers. A quaint conceit. But let us hope that our love story will end less tragically, she said, tenderly caressing his hair. Oh, we shall be happy, you and I, she added after a while. The iron finger of fate that lay so heavily on our lives is now withdrawn. Almost withdrawn. Yes, almost. Only almost. And then a sudden fear overcame her. No, she cried. Do not go. Do not go. Stay with me. Stay here. I feel so frightened. I don't know what comes over me. I'm afraid, afraid for you. No, dear, he rejoined. You need not be afraid in your heart. You don't want me to desert a friend. And besides, leave the best part of my artistic life in Reginald's clutch. Why should you expose yourself to God knows what danger for a friend who is ready to betray you? You forgot friendship is a gift. If it exacts payment in any form, it is no longer either a friendship or a gift. And you yourself have assured me that I have nothing to fear from Reginald. I have nothing to give him. She rallied under his words and had regained her self-possession when the door closed behind him. He walked a few blocks very briskly. Then his pace slackened. Her words had unsettled him a little, and when he reached home, he did not at once resume his ex exploration of Reginald's papers. He had hardly lit a cigarette when, at an unusually early hour, he heard Reginald's key in the lock. Quickly, he turned the light out, and in the semi-darkness, lit up by an electric lantern below, barricaded the door as on the previous night. Then he went to bed without finding sleep. Supreme silence reigned over the house. Even the elevator had ceased to run. Ernest's brain was all ear. He heard Reginald walking up and down on the studio. Not the smallest movement escaped his attention. Thus hours passed. When the clock struck 12, he was still walking up and down, down and up, up and down. One o'clock. Still, the measured beat of his footfall had not ceased. There was something hypnotic in the regular tread. Nature, at last, exacted its toll from the boy. He fell asleep. Hardly had he closed his eyes when again that horrible nightmare, no longer a nightmare, tormented him. Again he felt the pointed, delicate fingers carefully feeling the way along the innumerable tangled threads of nerve matter that leads to the innermost resource, recesses of self. A subconscious something strove to arouse him, and he felt the fingers softly withdrawn. He could have sworn that he heard the scurrying of feet in the room. Bathed in perspiration, he made a leap for the electric light. But there was no sign of any human presence. The barricade at the door was undisturbed. But fear, like a great wind, filled the wings of his soul. Yet there was nothing, nothing to warrant his conviction that Reginald Clark had been with him only a few moments ago, plying his horrible trade. The large mirror above the fireplace only showed him his own face, white, excited, the face of a madman. All right, chapter 29. 
What are you saying? Okay. The next morning's mail brought a letter from Ethel, a few lines of encouragement and affection. Yes, she was right. It would not do for him to stay under one roof with Reginald any longer. He must only obtain the manuscript and, if possible, surprise him in the attempt to exercise his mysterious and criminal power. Then he would be in the position to dictate the terms and demand Jack's safety at the price of his silence. Reginald, however, had closeted himself that day in his studio, busily writing. Only the clatter of his typewriter announced his presence in the house. There was no chance for the conversation or for obtaining the precious manuscript of Leontina. Meanwhile, Ernest was looking over his papers and preparing everything for a quick departure. Glancing over old letters and notes, he became readily interested and hardly noticed the passage of the hours. When the night came, he only partly undressed and threw himself upon the bed. It was now ten. At twelve, he had promised Ethel to speak to her over the telephone. He was determined not to sleep at all that night. At last, he would discover whether or not on the previous and other nights Reginald had secretly entered his room. When one hour had passed without incident, his attention relaxed a little. His eyes were gradually closing when suddenly something seemed to stir at the door. The Chinese vase came rattling to the floor. At once, Ernest sprang up. His face had blanched with terror. It was whiter than the linen on which they wrapped the dead, but his soul was resolute. He touched a button and the electric light illuminated the whole chamber. There was no nook for even a shadow to hide. Yet there was no one to be seen. From without the door came no sound. Suddenly, something soft touched his foot. He gathered all his willpower so as to not break out into a frenzied shriek. Then he laughed, not a hearty laugh to be sure. A tiny nose and a tail gracefully curled were brushing against him. The source of the disturbance was a little Maltese cat, his favorite, that by some chance had remained in his room. After it essay at midnight gymnastics, the animal quieted down and lay purring at the foot of his bed. The presence of a living thing was a certain comfort, and the reservoir of his strength was well nigh exhausted. He dimly remembered that his promise to Ethel, but his lips drooped with sheer weariness. Perhaps an hour passed in this way when suddenly his blood congealed with dread. He felt the presence of the hand of Reginald Clark, unmistakably groping in his brain as if searching for something that had escaped him. He tried to move, to cry out, but his limbs were paralyzed. When, by a superhuman effort, he at last succeeded in shaking off the numbness that held him enchained, he awoke just in time to see a figure, that of a man, disappearing in the wall that separated Reginald's apartment from his room. This time it was no delusion of the senses. He heard something like a secret door softly closing behind the retreating steps. A sudden fierce anger seized him. He was oblivious of the danger of this terrible power of the older man, oblivious of the love he had once borne him, oblivious of everything save the sense of outraged humanity and outraged right. The law permits us to shoot a burglar who goes through our pockets at night. Must he tolerate the ravages of this a thousand times more dastardly and dangerous spiritual thief? Was Reginald to enjoy the fruit of other men's labor unpunished? Was he to continue growing into the mountain? mightiest literary factor of the century by preying upon his betters? Abel, Wacom, Ethel, he, Jack, were they all to be victims of this insatiable monster? Was this force restless as it was, I'm sorry, was this force resistless as it was relentless? No, a thousand times no. He dashed himself against the wall at the place where the shadow of Reginald Clark had disappeared. In doing so, he touched upon a secret spring. The wall gave way noiselessly. Speechless with rage, he crossed the next room, and the one adjoining it, and stood in Reginald's studio. The room was brilliantly lighted, and Reginald, still dressed, was seated at this writing table, scribbling notes upon little scraps of paper in his accustomed manner. At earnest approach, he looked up without evincing even the least sign of terror or surprise. Calmly, almost majestically, he folded his arms over his breast, but there was a menacing glitter in his eyes as he confronted his victim. Silently, the two men faced each other. Then Ernest hissed, Thief! Reginald shrugged his shoulders. Vampire! So Ethel has infected you with her absurd fancies. Poor boy, I'm afraid. I've been wanting to tell you for some time, but I think we have reached the parting of our road. 
And that, you dared to tell me? The more he raged, the calmer Reginald seemed to become. Really, he said, I fail to understand. I must ask you to leave my room. You fail to understand. You cad, Ernest cried. He stepped to the writing table and opened the secret drawer with a blow. A bundle of manuscripts fell on the floor with a strange rustling noise. Then, seizing his own story, he hurled it upon the table. And behold, the last pages bore corrections in ink that could have been made only a few minutes ago. Reginald smiled. Have you come to play havoc with my manuscripts? He remarked. Your manuscripts? Reginald Clark, you are an impudent imposter. You have written no word that is your own. You are an embezzler of the mind, strutting through life in borrowed and stolen plumes. And at once the mask fell from Reginald's face. Why stolen, he coolly said with a slight touch of irritation. I absorb. I appropriate. This is the most any artist can say for himself. God creates. Man molds. He gives us the colors. We mix them. That is not the question. I charge you with having willfully and criminally interfered in my life. I charge you with having robbed me of what was mine. I charge you with being utterly vile and rapacious, a hypocrite and a parasite. Foolish boy, Reginald rejoined austerely, it is through me that the best in you shall survive, even as the obscure Elizabethans lived in him of Avon Shakespeare, absorbed what was great in little men, a greatness that otherwise would have perished, and gave it a setting, a life. <clears throat> a thief may plead the same. I understand you better. It is your inordinate vanity that prompts you to abuse your monstrous power. You err. Self-love has never entered into my actions. I am a careless of personal fame. Look at me, boy. As I stand before you, I am Homer. I am Shakespeare. I am every cosmic man manifestation in art. Men have doubted in each incarnation my individual existence. Historians have more to tell of the meanest Athenian scribbler or Elizabethan poetaster than of me. The radiance of my work obscured my very self. I care not. I have a mission. I am a servant of the Lord. I am a vessel that bears the host. He stood up at full length, the personification of grandeur and power. A tremendous force trembled in his very fingertips. He was like a gigantic dynamo, charged with the might of a thousand magnetic storms that shake the earth in its orbit and lash myriads of planets through infinities of space. Under ordinary circumstances, Ernest, or any other man, would have quailed before him. But the boy, in that epic moment, had grown out of his stature. He felt the sword of vengeance in his hand. To him was entrusted the cause of Abel and of Wacom, of Ethel and of Jack. His was the struggle of the individual soul against the same blind and cruel fate that in the past had fashioned the <laughs> Ichthyosaurus and the Mastodon. By what right, he cried, do you assume that you were the literary messiah? Who appointed you? What divine power has made you the steward of my might and of theirs whom you have robbed? I am a light bearer. I tread the high hills of mankind. I point the way to the future. I light up the abysses of the past. Were not my stature gigantic, how could I hold the torch in all of men's sight? The very souls that I tread underfoot realize as their dying gaze follows me the possibilities with which the future is big, eternally secure. I carry the essence of what is cosmic, of what is divine. I am Homer, Goethe, Shakespeare. I am an embodiment of the same force of which Alexander, Caesar, Confucius, and the Christos were also embodiments, none so strong as to resist me. A sudden madness overcame Ernest at this boast. He must strike now or never. He must rid humanity of this dangerous maniac, this demon of strength. With a power ten times intensified, he raised a heavy chair as to hurl it at Reginald's head and crush it. Reginald stood there calmly, a smile upon his lips. Primal cruelties rose from the depth of his nature. Still, he smiled, turning his luminous gaze upon the boy, and behold, Ernest's hand began to shake. The chair fell from his grasp. He tried to call for help, but no sound issued from his lips. Utterly paralyzed, he confronted the force. Minutes, eternities passed, and still those eyes were fixed upon him. But this was no longer Reginald. It was all brain, only brain, a tremendous brain machine, infinitely complex, infinitely strong. Not more than a mile away, Ethel endeavored to call to him through the night. The telephone rang once, twice, thrice, insistingly, but Ernest heard it not. Something dragged him, 
Drag the nerves from his body. Drag, drag, drag. It was an irresistible suction. Pitiless, passionless, immense. Sparks, blue, crimson, and violet, seemed to play around the, the living battery. It reached the finest fibers of his mind. Slowly, every trace of mentality disappeared. First the will, then feeling, judgment, memory, fear even. All this was stored in his brain cells, came forth to be absorbed by that mighty engine. The princess with the yellow veil appeared, flitted across the room and melted away. She was followed by childhood memories, girls' heads, boys' faces. He saw his dead mother waving her arms to him. An expression of death agony distorted the placid features. Then, throwing a kiss to him, she too disappeared. Picture on picture followed. Words of love that he had spoken. Sins, virtues, magnamin, mag, magna, magnanimities. Meanness, terrors, mathematical formulas even and snatches of songs. Leontina came and was swallowed up. No, it was Ethel who was trying to speak to him, trying to warn. She waved her hands in frantic despair. She was gone. A pale face, dark, disheveled hair. Jack. How he had changed. He was in the circle of the vampire's transforming might. Jack, he cried. Surely Jack had something to explain, something to tell him, some word that if spoken would bring rest to his soul. He saw the words rise to the boy's lips, and before he had time to utter them, his image also had vanished. And Reginald? Reginald too was gone. There was only the mighty brain, panting, whirling. Then there was nothing. The annihilation of Ernest Fielding was complete. Vacantly he stared at the walls of the room and at his master. The latter was wiping the sweat from his forehead. He breathed deeply. The flush of youth spread over his features. His eyes sparkled with a new and dangerous brilliancy. He took the thing that had once been Ernest Fielding by the hand and led it to its room. With the first flush of the morning, Ethel appeared at the door of the house on Riverside Drive. She had not heard from Ernest and had been unable to obtain connection with him at the telephone. Anxiety hastened her steps. She brushed against Jack, who was also directing his steps to the abode of Reginald Clark. At the same time, something that resembled Ernest Fielding passed from the house of the vampire. It was a dull and brutish thing, hideously transformed without a vestige of mind. Mr. Fielding, cried Ethel, beside herself with fear as she saw him descending. Ernest, Jack gasped, no less startled at the change in his friend's appearance. Ernest's head followed the source of the sound, but no spark of recognition illuminated the deadness of his eyes. Without a present and without a past, blindly, a gibbering idiot, he stumbled down the stairs. Okay, we completed it. Not really homoerotic by my terms. Um, a little bit gay, a little bit vampire -y. It picked up at the end. Um, but we finished it. Good for us. Thanks for sticking with me. Um, Somebody asked me about what we're going to do with these books when we're done. Um, for now, we're going to make them for sale. We're going to make them available. And if uh, if you actually want this copy, I can um, sign it, you know, write you something. Um, we're going to put them available in our uh, retail area on our website at www.bedtimewithbruce.com. Um, I have had a wonderful time reading to you this book. Um I'm going to find something a little more homoerotic for the next one, the next time we read one. Uh, we've got a few that we're, we're deciding between. Um, I think we're actually going to look it up on the Internet and try to get a count on how many times the word penis is, <laughs> is in it, and we'll, we'll rate them that way. We'll, you know, we will try to get the one with the most penises in it, just to make up for the lack of penises in this book. Uh, but it was fun. Thank you. I'm glad we made it through. And uh, visit us at our website, www.bedtimewithbruce.com. Um, I'm going to say good night to you now and uh, look for some big changes on our uh, show coming up. I will see you all next time. Thank you so much. Have a great night.